So, uh, um, welcome. I am Hannah Buxbaum, Vice President for International Affairs here at IU, and I um, am very happy to welcome everyone to this panel discussion. So, we have all been watching Russia's attack on Ukraine in disbelief and outrage and fear. We have been watching with concern for the safety and well-being of the people of Ukraine, among them, of course, many friends, colleagues, research collaborators, and alumni of Indiana University, and of course, um, the family and friends of many of our own community members. We are watching with concern for peace and stability in Europe and beyond, and with concern for the future of our international order. As an academic community, we have a special role to play in convening experts to consider these events, bringing diverse experiences and disciplinary perspectives to bear in the conversation. And this three-day teach-in seeks to do exactly that. And enormous thanks are due to the Robert F. Burns Russian and East European Institute and its intrepid director, Sarah Phillips, for envisioning and coordinating such an incredible set of events. So for this panel, there is a lot to talk about. And as you can see, um, there are many colleagues here ready to do that. So I am going to keep introductions to a minimum. And my goal is simply to provide some orientation for you in terms of the particular experience and expertise that each panelist will bring to the discussion. So in alphabetical order, Timothy Brick is a researcher at the Kiev School of Economics, where he also leads the Center for Sociological Research, uh, Decentralization, and Local Development Studies. He works on the sociology of religion, economic history, and social network analysis. Stanislav Budnitsky is a postdoctoral fellow here at the Russian Studies Workshop at REEI. He is a scholar of global communication with a focus on Russian media and cyber politics. And um, I understand that during this conflict, he has been following in particular Russian media developments to discern official and alternative narratives available to domestic audiences. Elizabeth Dunn is professor of geography and director of IU's new Center for Refugee Studies. Yay. She has worked in East Central Europe since 1991. And um, in 2008, she was actually on her way to the Republic of Georgia when the country was invaded by Russia and ended up spending 16 months um, living in a camp there for internally displaced people. So um, in addition to her academic work and, and work with this new center, um, Professor Dunn serves on the board of Exodus Refugee Immigration and is the director of the Bloomington Refugee Support Network. Sarah Phillips, the director of REAI, is an anthropologist who since the mid-1990s has done extensive field work in Ukraine on topics including gender and civil society, the Ukrainian disability rights movement, Chernobyl disaster, and HIV and drug use. She has collaborated with scholars at Karazin National University and the National University of Kiev Moyla Academy and has conducted research in eight different Ukrainian cities as well as rural areas of the country. Natalia Shapova is chair of the Kyiv School of Economics Institute, where she is also vice president for policy research. She earned a master's degree from Taras Shevchenko National University and a master's in economic analysis from the Kyiv School of Economics. And she works on policy research in the areas of public procurement, financial burden of healthcare costs, and private sector growth strategies. She served as a contributor to the Ukraine Reform Monitoring Project of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Polina Vlasenko is a visiting assistant professor at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Akron. Her research interests include assisted reproductive technologies, commodification of women's bodies, social reproduction, and post-socialist transformations in Ukraine. And um, she holds a PhD in medical anthropology from IUB, along with a BA in political science from the National University of Kivmolya Academy. 
Tim Waters is professor of law here at the Maurer School of Law and is the associate director of the Law School's Center for Constitutional Democracy. His research focuses on legal regulation of violent conflict, war crimes, and state formation. Um, prior to joining IU, he worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And finally, Justina Zayec is a professor of practice in European Security Studies in the Departments of International Studies and Political Science and is director of the Polish Studies Center. Her research interests are in the area of international relations, European security, and Central and Eastern Europe in particular. So again, as you can see, the, our, our panelists come from a wide range of, of disciplinary perspectives and have a wide range of experience in the region. And we are very much looking forward to this conversation. So um, I, I think it is important first to focus on what is happening in Ukraine on the ground. And we are really fortunate to have these two colleagues joining us um, from Ukraine. And I would like to begin with them. So I know that both of you have been in dialogue with people from all over the world about what is happening, about the conflict. And so I think you're seeing something about how the conflict is being viewed and being processed from outside. What are we missing? What, what can you tell us about what is happening from, from inside the conflict at this time? And let me start with Natalia, please. Um, thank you. So um, basically right now I am uh, near Kyiv city, but not in the um, epicenter of what's uh, going on, and it's comparatively safe. Uh, my uh, team is uh, in very distant locations. We have uh, around 50 people uh, with whom I work directly. Somebody stayed in Kiev. Uh, somebody uh, is uh, traveling across Ukraine, trying to find some safer place. Uh, most of people uh, stay in Ukraine. Uh, three analysts, uh, they joined military forces or territorial defense units and uh, over the last nights they didn't sleep uh, and uh, were shooting at the uh, saboteurs, uh, Russian saboteurs in the uh, city of Kyiv or Zhitomir. Uh, many of my friends, uh, they had to stay in quite hot places because uh, the family members are disabled and that's basically very hard uh, on poor people and uh, on older people, of course. Uh, so many of my, my cities uh, where we worked, uh, where our relatives are, are destroyed. Uh, like in Kharkiv or in Sumy, and uh, the cities, the places where in Kiev uh, we were, you know, walking. My mother's work, my mother worked. Um, uh, they are were shot in the recent days, uh, but uh, at the same time we all continue uh, working on. Uh, uh, so we are analysts, and uh, most of us are pretty useless in uh, uh, warfare. Uh, we know only how to push buttons on the computer. Uh, so we continue doing that. We monitoring uh, uh, situation, uh, like an economic in economic situation, sanctions, uh, damage that has been caused uh, by the war to Ukraine for the government and for the media, trying to. Um, share uh, with the international community what's going on and what's the perspective uh, coming up with uh, various sanctions. So it feels like Ukraine is uh, like we are a lot of ants and uh, we are fighting all together and the spirit is very high. We are sure that uh, we, uh, we're going to win and we will stay till last and protect the freedom and uh, the world where evil is not tolerated, uh, but is uh, fight for. Thank you, over. Thank you. Uh, yes, Timothy, please. Uh, also, I guess it's my time to say a couple words. Um, let me also start saying uh, 
Thank you. Thank you for uh, paying attention to Ukraine, for your support with Philip, and for inviting us. I will add to what Natalia just said that uh, also our students and alumni uh, also participate in various volunteering activities. Some of them also join territorial forces. Uh, many of them right now are packing uh, supplies, medicine, helmets, uh, radio. Uh, they work night and day of, uh, you know, in, in, in making uh, logistics of that. So all the community of East Coast Economics is working on that. And to answer to your question um, specifically, uh, I think you asked it in a bit uh, provocative way. You said, what are you missing? I, I think that surprisingly, in the US, um, you, you, you got a lot of information, you got a lot of it right, uh, compared to Russia. Despite the geographical distance, somehow Putin's regime needs calculated to pay greatly, uh, whereas people in the United States have better understanding of what uh, is going on in Ukraine. And nevertheless, I, I, I'd like to say that I have, I have been on uh, several events already yesterday and the day before, different panels I tried to listen to, and surprisingly, even in the intellectual centers uh, that's supposed to study Ukraine, and when, you know, in a room of very smart people who, who know a lot about Ukraine and, and are motivated to talk about Ukraine, surprisingly, a lot of people still talk about Putin, Putin's actions, Putin's mind, uh, reaction of NATO, reaction of European Union, and somehow we can sit here for two hours and talk about the war, and we don't talk about Ukraine. We don't talk about people and uh, Ukrainian nation and Ukrainian government and Ukrainian plans. And I think uh, this is what can be improved, uh, that we, even we, Ukrainian scholars, scholars who live in Ukraine or those who live abroad but study Ukraine, all of us, sometimes we, we don't discuss agency of Ukraine, and I would like to see it uh, improved. So, uh, thank you, over. Thank you, and, and I, I should say, I think we should, w with this group, um, we, we may as well forget about structured <laughs> interventions, and uh, just let me know, raise your, raise your hand or grab a microphone if you would like to, if you would like to respond to any of, any of the other panelists' comments. Um, so in that, in that response, you've already raised um, one of the questions that I think connects Stanislav with, with the work that you are doing right now, which is to look at you know, the, the media coverage within Russia and then also, um, also outside. So would, would you like to say a little bit about what you were seeing on that score? Sure. Um. I'm sorry to be starting with Russia, not Ukraine, but um, I, I study Russian. I'll, I promise I'll then uh, pass on the microphone to, to my colleagues who actually um, study Ukraine. Um, yeah, so I've been uh, uh, following the both state-aligned media and uh, I call them alternative voices, so, so platforms where you can get uh, views that are alternative. And so I'll just say a few words basically uh, as briefly as I can about what Russian audiences are seeing. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll start with a, 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 tweet, a tweet, actually, that I saw earlier today that I think very um, am, uh, sums up sort of what's happening because uh, it was a, a colleague of ours, a scholar of Russia, I, I unfortunately don't remember who, and he said, I'm constantly being asked, well, how can Russian people believe like what they're told on TV? How is, how is that even possible? And he said, well, think of your American, you know, British, Canadian uh, conspiracy theater uh, theory uncles who have all the information uh, in the world available to them and somehow they still you know, believe that the, the world is flat, for example. So um, it is unfortunately true that uh, it, especially in an environment which, where information is available still somehow in Russia, it is, the narrative is dominated uh, by um, state-aligned um, uh, media. So I watched, I, watch a marathon of all the week, weekly analytical programs um, and it's like a parallel reality. Um, the, what struck me is the degree to which um, the 
frames and the narratives and even the specific segments and even the shot by shot um, uh, reports were uh, coordinated along across um, all the channels along uh, across all the programs. So this is an extremely tightly coordinated effort, uh, more so than, than usual than we normally see. Uh, the information is very sparse and what's shocking, the thing that shocked me the most is that there was no talk about um, the actual military action. So there was constant justification why Russia started the so-called quote-unquote uh, oper you know, military operation uh, to liberate Ukraine again, quote-unquote. Um, but there was no footage, no mention of any of the actual um, military action. And the, all the talk was about the, how the um, strikes are surgical, again, quote-unquote, their, their term, not mine. Um, how it only struck um, military and other logistical infrastructure and not targeted Ukraine, how, uh, by contrast, Ukrainians were shielding themselves, the Ukrainian army was shielding themselves with the, with the civilians and putting them up front, how the morale is low, how there are all these people surrendering. Um, so it was truly like um, a parallel reality. And so um, the question is then, well, what can Russians do? Do they look for alternative sources? And as I was telling uh, to my colleagues uh, just now before we started, there are some, let's say half a dozen, maybe a dozen sources that are available still, uh, mostly online, mostly websites. Um, and I was doing a teaching yesterday, and by the time I finished my hour-long talk um, and, and opened my smartphone to read the latest, um, and I had a slide with all those organizations, two of them were already shut down. So things are moving very fast, and I don't know if in a, in a week, a long time, uh, in a week's time, we're gonna have those organizations still, so yeah, uh, we should see that. Um, and the last very quick thing I wanna say is that um, even though um, that information is available online to those who wish to, to find it, who, who seek that information, um, I think the long-held assumption that there is this TV audience um, and then separately internet audience that is somehow liberal, always seeking alternative viewpoints, is anti-regime. Um, I think we should abandon that assumption because no data bears it out, not by the uh, most popular websites that are visited, not by the uh, most popular uh, sites on, so on Russian social media. Yes, uh, online, let's say alternative or liberal or independent sources are more popular than, than offline. But by and large, even the online media sphere and media discourses, media narratives are still very much shaped and defined by the agenda and the frames that are set by the state. So these are, we should no longer think of this online, Russian online sphere as somehow this haven of oppositional thinking. Um, I mean, there's more to say, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. So I, I, I don't know if anyone else would like to follow up on, on this general theme, but there, you know, it's been quite striking from the American perspective, some of the um, tropes of, of resistance and, and, and heroism and there, you know, not to mention the memification of, of um, you know, individuals, right, involved in this. It, it, any comments on that? Can you hear me? Is this on? Okay. Um, that's a great point, Hannah. And um, a couple of things about the Ukrainian media. And then I'd love to hear from our colleagues in Kiev, and perhaps Polina could also speak to this, because I know you follow the Ukrainian media. I feel like our colleagues in Ukraine have done an exceptionally good job of educating us here in the U.S. about what are the credible um, news outlets. And so I'm constantly getting, you know, on Telegram or Facebook, WhatsApp, all the social media, um, my colleagues are saying, you know, here's what you and your, student, your students should be reading. Here's what I want you to put up on your website. And I think that is one of the reasons, you know, Timothy mentioned that it, it seems like the U.S., you know, population is pretty well um, educated about what's going on. I think that's one um, one reason, and it's it's to the credit of you know our colleagues in Ukraine who have helped helped us um, do that. I don't know, Polina, if you had any comments on that, or or Timothy or Natalia. But I think it would be um, productive to talk more about the Ukrainian uh, media space. I think maybe Timothy wants wants to say something. No. Sorry. 
yeah. about Ukrainian media space, correct? Sure. Does, yeah, yeah, does that hear the question, sorry. Yeah, can you just repeat the question or the statement because I think I, I, I lost you. Just maybe to expand a bit on the Ukrainian media space. Um, so basically, you want me to just to broadly comment on Ukrainian media, yeah? Uh, okay, good. Sorry, I will, I will improvise a bit. Yeah, so I, I, I can tell from my own experience uh, that information flow is, uh, um, is crucial now and it's, there is no shortage of information. Uh, a lot of people use social media for their own purposes, any type of media. It can be Telegram, WhatsApp, Viber, and um, Signal. And a lot of people want to stay in touch with their friends or volunteers or even with the government. So people start using those media which they uh, did not use before. For instance, I did not use Signal. I don't like it. I don't prefer Viber. And nevertheless, I use everything because I want to stay in touch with so many different bubbles, volunteers, people that I constantly use everything. So this is one. So people use a lot of media. Second, uh, I have to acknowledge, uh, and I'm very proud of uh, users and regular citizens, that people are very cautious about fakes and disinformation. So every time there is a, a new, some news in the chat, uh, about some activities or news or uh, military activities, a lot of people immediately start to question sources. They ask questions like, where, where did you get it? Uh, what is the source? Can you prove it? So I think people have realized that uh, this information is, a, is something significant. It's a real thing, and they have to be cautious about it. Uh, surprisingly, um, well, I'm saying this, uh, I don't know whether surprise is a, is a correct term here or not, but people show a lot of trust to official uh, channels. So we have a lot of Telegram channels like um, local city administration Telegram channel or um, uh, oblast level administration Telegram, uh, a Telegram of uh, police, of firefighters. So official channels work extremely well. They publish relevant information, they um, keep us posted, people forward uh, this information because they trust to this information. And media, um, also uh, institutions, I mean journalists, they are very diligent and efficient. First of all, mainstream TV channels, they did unite in one kind of consortium so they can uh, broadcast things 24 hours, they work in shifts and uh, share content with each other and those uh, who, who post on telegram they do it also carefully after verifying with official channels i remember there were a lot of complaints from readers that maybe the news are getting going slow updates are slow but the response of media is that we need to wait we need to verify it so i was pretty happy about that uh, regarding, so that was about discipline, content, you know, motivation of uh, users and media managers. But regarding content, of course, people read and repost everything which is connected to humanitarian aid. This is important. People try to coordinate and help to each other. Uh, whether blog posts work well, uh, which city is more safe now, are there any bombs on the road? who needs help. So people really discuss humanitarian things, people discuss uh, military events, and um, yeah, of course, there is this sense of uh, patriotism and rally, uh, so people discuss uh, losses of Russian soldiers. I see a lot of reposts, you know, pictures of prisoners and um, records. So there are a lot of video records of um, when these prisoners are questioned uh, um, and usually they put on record very often they talk to their parents on phones and this is recorded and then people share it to, so they can send it somewhere you know to Russia to their relatives whatever uh, so yeah so there is a lot of content 
there is no shortage of content, and people try to use it uh, either to keep the morale or to coordinate and help volunteers and army. Uh, over. Hello. <laughs> Um, I can second that. I, I mostly myself follow Instagram channels uh, of different um, uh, administrations of different cities in Ukraine. So like Kharkiv, where I'm from, Odessa, uh, Kiev, all of those administrations constantly uh, post updates about the um, situation uh, uh, and uh, about resistance uh, to uh, Russian forces. and. Um, uh, I also wanted to say that uh, Timofey brought up this important, I think, aspect of Ukrainian people self-organizing and uh, using media to uh, not only to inform each other, um, but also to assist each other in different ways. And I think that um, goes also beyond Ukraine somehow, uh, which is amazing, I think. Because <laughs> my fam family traveled through like all of the Ukraine and now they travel from all Moldova and Romania, and uh, like these uh, connections that are uh, made between different organizations and the information um, that they spread that is useful uh, for, for example, refugees to find a place to stay or for refugees to find lawyers, etc. This information spreads so fast, like I've never seen that happen in my life. Well, I've never been in this situation before, but uh, it's like you can find a place to stay in any city in like 15 minutes. Um, and um, uh, yeah, that's just what I wanted to add that um, in addition to Ukrainian people reporting about events and in addition to uh, different uh, uh, media um, being very diligent um, about um, uh, checking all of this evidence and uh, avoiding any fake information, partly also because I think this information, this idea of the fake news is often used by the Russian propaganda to say that, oh well, uh, you have one or two fake videos that makes like all of your videos posted on this Telegram channel fake. So I think that partly to protect ourselves from that, uh, we are very diligent in posting only those uh, things that are, um, uh, that we have proof of or evidence of. Um, and uh, yeah, in addition to that, I think uh, this idea of uh, self-organization and coordination um, is spreading from Ukraine to Poland and to Romania and to other places that are now receiving Ukrainian refugees in huge amounts and are assisting them. Yeah, thank you. Am I on? Yeah. I'd like to um, amplify a point that Timothy made that I think went by without enough comment, which was this question of how we should think of this, of this war. And I've seen a lot of commentary um, that tries to blame uh, the United States or Western Europe for this war and say that it is the fault of, of NATO for wanting to come so close to Russia that it put Russia in a defensive position. And that the answer to this now is for Washington and Moscow to agree that, that Ukraine will be neutral territory and that NATO will never come there. And I, I've seen this argument put forth by a wide variety of people. And it is interesting to me that we see over and over this, this formulation as if Moscow and Washington should have the right to determine Ukraine's future, Ukraine's foreign policy, Ukraine's alliances. Look, Washington and Moscow are not mom and dad who get to make decisions for their little children like Ukraine. When you make that kind of an argument, which says that the great powers should decide for smaller countries, what you're advancing is, quite frankly, a very imperialist argument, which puts forward the idea that there is some justifiable or natural sphere of influence within which some countries get to decide the fates of others. And I think if you care about democracy, you, that's not a tenable notion, that some countries get to make decisions for other countries, that some people decide the fates of others. 
So I, I would like to really push back on that argument. And the second thing I would like to say is just how amazing the humanitarian response, um, both in Ukraine and in countries across the border has been. It has been, I think, the one of the world's first crowdsourced refugee migrations. There was certainly a lot in Berlin when the Syrians came, uh, in Germany, all over Germany when the, when the Syrians came. But I have, in general, humanitarian aid is the province of states or of international organizations. And here we're seeing the vast majority of aid coming in early, coming in in a very well-organized form, has been coming in at the grassroots level. And I have never seen this before in 20 years of studying humanitarian aid. It's been truly amazing and definitely a product of the digital revolution. Is it also, in, in addition to being connected to the digital re revolution, and it is, it, it, both Timothy and, and Polina were mentioning how social media is actually being used as an instrument now to, to mobilize this, this kind of aid. It also says something, I think, about the state of civil society in Ukraine. And Sarah, I know this has been a topic of your research for years. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Hannah. I mean, um, Seeing how civil society has unfolded in Ukraine over the last 25 years has been amazing, um, especially when I look back and think that it was precisely the fact that um, the people I met in Kiev the first time I ever went there in 1995 were taking such good care of one another that made me want to study this country and that kept me there. Um, you know, I went to study the Chernobyl disaster and I ended up studying women's social activism and disability rights because I kept running into these amazing civic activists that um, were building civil society from the ground up. And, you know, if we look at where Ukraine's been, uh, right, over the last um, decades, we've got the Orange Revolution, we've got the Euromaidan, the Revolution of Dignity, um, and now this war, I mean, the, the way that people have risen to the challenge, the way that they, as, as Elizabeth said, this crowdsourcing of humanitarian aid, it's, it's just been amazing. I don't like to use the word inspiring because in disability studies, that's a bad word. It's, it's something you don't, you don't say, but I'm truly inspired um, by, by, uh, by the Ukrainians. And I know so many of us are. I agree with you, Elizabeth, that the humanitarian response um, on the ground has been amazing. I mean, I, you know, I'm in contact with my friends who are in Kharkiv, you know, in bomb shelters who have, you know, found um, safer environs in the country, um, maybe gone to the Carpathians because they feel like it's a safer place. And they are always sending me information about how we can help people who are in a worse situation than they are. And it's just, it's amazing um, how their, you know, their first thought and the first thing that they want to communicate is that these other people need help. But I will say, um, it's still not enough. Uh, you know, my, what my friends are telling me uh, is that they really, really want an international uh, safe corridor, a way to get people out safely from the country that's regulated internationally. And of course, um, you know, humanitarian convoys coming in to the country. So I'd love to talk more about that uh, if folks are interested. But I would say, yeah, let's be inspired by Ukrainian civil society and, and mutual aid, but let's not pretend that it's nearly enough and up to what people actually need. Of course, the, the strength of, of civil society that will be required to, to really cope with this humanitarian crisis is not just, it won't just be in Ukraine. Poland and, you know, it, it's it's going to require very, very strong response across the board. Um, and the people really organize themselves in helping the Ukrainian refugees. So, like, you know, to open shelters for, for, for Ukrainian refugees, uh, to bring food, to bring clothes, you know, the everyday articles that are really, that are really needed. Uh, sympathy has 
I mean, they've always been on the side of the Ukrainians uh, when we talk about the Ukrainian-Russia relations. Uh, this is this problem for the countries in Central Europe and Central Eastern Europe, as Elizabeth mentioned, it's that we have this uh, really bad uh, luck that we are located uh, now between those great powers and we have been always, the, you know, like Poland, Ukraine, the Baltic states, uh, you know, Many decisions were be, were taken behind the backs of the of those countries, um, and as much as I really sympathize that you know the country like middle-sized countries and the small countries they can decide by themselves and they should decide by themselves. Unfortunately, what we see this is the reaction of Russia. Um, what what is going on? What is going on today? Um, but again, I would like to say to Timothy and to Natalie that if you would like really, um, you know, any kind of help of how we can assist and like from Poland, uh, you know, like the, at the University of Warsaw, I know that students come and ask uh, how they can help and they want to help, but they are not sure what is really needed and what help they can, they, they, they can provide. Then just, I will be happy also, you know, to, to help, to make like the contacts, uh, really to help you as much as, uh, as possible. Uh, you know, we really also sat at the University of Warsaw because we have quite a lot of the uh, Ukrainian students. And since the invasion, many of them, especially male uh, students, they came back to Ukraine to fight. And like yesterday, we were even told that one of the Ukrainian students, he was killed in the, in the fighting. So it's, it's really, you know, again, let us know how we can help and how we can, you know, how we can contribute uh, to help you more. Tim, I think I saw you reaching for the, yes? Elizabeth was quite uh, critical of people who say, um, you know, that uh, Moscow, Washington should uh, decide this conflict. Um, I think I would be understood or rather misunderstood as one of those people, but it's, it's okay. I don't take it personally. Um, I say misunderstood because I think the, where I would disagree is it's not a question of whether they should, but whether they, they will. Right? that a, a realist understanding of international relations has very little space for a, a, a moral analysis, not because people, you know, analysts are amoral, but because they recognize that that is a more accurate way to understand the world. And this was implicit in something that Sarah said. I don't know if she would agree with me otherwise, but these are not uh, issues that are going to be solved solely by private action, by the actions of Ukrainians, although clearly that is essential. I don't think we'd be having this conversation today if the level of resistance inside Ukraine was not unexpectedly much higher than uh, Putin and others uh, uh, imagined it would be. But that does not mean that this conflict is going to be resolved by private action, local resistance, its humanitarian aspects. Um, and to talk about, uh, to expect and plan for the likely outcome that great powers will decide this uh, event, I, I think is not something we should condemn, but simply observe. And in a sense, if you want to make a kind of moral argument about it, it is responsible to plan uh, realistically. Uh, the other thing I would note, and this is where I would strongly you know, diverge from the way you frame it, you spoke about this, your, your argument, and, and I, I, I accept the, the passion as a human being. I, I fully understand it and at some level agree. Um, but you talked about it as being somehow undemocratic. Again, I think this profoundly misunderstands the, the, the system in which we operate. It, it would, why would one think that this is a democratic system? That is to say, a state, Ukraine, yes, but the international system isn't democratic, and to the degree it attempts to be is where it is at its most feckless. If I could just give the example uh, of today, some of you will, will know that the General Assembly voted on a resolution in an emergency session about this conflict. We can talk more about it later, perhaps. Um, but it struck me when, when Timothy mentioned that we need to talk more about Ukraine. I, I, the first thing that crossed my mind is when I turned on the, the coverage today of it, and the first speaker I heard uh, was the representative of the Solomon Islands. Um, and no disrespect to the Solomon Islands, but obviously this is not a major player, but they have the same vote as Russia and China 
Uh, you'll be glad to know the Solomon Islands, Islands voted in favor of the resolution. Um, but that's not really consequential. That's the democracy in our system of global governance, so-called. Uh, and that's precisely the places where it is least likely to be doing something effective or meaningful. Right? The idea that the system is set up to give the Solomon Islands and China an equal vote is just another way of saying you can expect very little consequential to come out of that. The places where actual meaningful power will be exercised are precisely the undemocratic components of our system. And that is not to, to defend that, but to describe it. All right, anyway, this is, this is where I strongly take a different view, that the, the word should is not what we should be dealing with, but, but shall. Underestimates the impact that Ukraine itself has had on this conflict. And they, and Zelensky gave a very moving speech to the Council of Europe in which he said, now at least you must accept we are your equal. And I, I think he's right in saying that, that he is demanding the same kinds of rights of self-determination that the other countries in Europe enjoy. It, one of the things that we have found is that the great powers and, and their scope of action has shifted dramatically over the course of this conflict. And we've seen that the impact of small states can be large. For example, Taiwan has ceased shipping semiconductor chips to Moscow. That's a big change. That is, that is changing the Russian economy from the get-go because Taiwan is a major supplier of semiconductors to the Russian economy. So I, I think this is a much more multipolar conflict than we have accounted for. And I, and I also think that if you make if, if Washington and Moscow were to get together and make a decision that the Ukrainian people did not accept, they would be certainly willing to continue fighting onwards. And they've said that over and over. So I, um, I find that realism very often prescribes limits in the guise of describing them. And I think the limits are much more fluid and flexible in international politics today than we may have thought. So, uh, Elizabeth, you, you said just now that Zelensky is calling for Ukraine to be afforded the same right of self-determination that other European states have. But, of course, he's also calling for, uh, for immediate accession to the European Union itself, right? In other words, that, that is a, a, um, that part of what he, he is advocating for right now. So, um, so let's talk about that a, a, a little. And... and Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, thanks for noticing. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment quickly on two um, separated points which you raised. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, to Justina about uh, you know what you said about Warsaw University and possible support. Um, I just uh, want to say that obviously there are two types, uh, uh, two ways. Uh, that are obvious how you how your students uh, support us and professors support us. One is through humanitarian help and solidarity. Yeah, all universities now united also in providing humanitarian aid, but also in supporting selected students or uh, postdocs, professors with scholarships, contracts. It's great. And yet there is one more way to support uh, Ukrainian universities, which has not been widely discussed. And Nevertheless, uh, we, we seriously considering that this is a viable option. Uh, we believe that this is a good chance for international universities to think about new uh, long-term uh, joint programs and double degrees uh, with Ukrainian universities. A lot of universities now are trying to cut ties with Russian universities as a part of international sanctions. And I think this is a good uh, time to channel all these resources and, um, and efforts to build new programs with the Ukrainian universities. Of course, in Russia, there is right now a lot of great students and scholars who individually deserve you know, our attention and support. But institutionally, Russian universities uh, very often are compliant with the Russian administration. So um, this is a big issue also for international scientific community, what to do. And I, I think uh, building these new 
double degrees and international programs with Ukrainian universities can be a viable option, you know, not only to rebuild and to support Ukrainian education, but even to build, you know, like a future uh, top schools in Europe. And about the comment from Timothy about pra pragmatism, I, 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 I'm, I'm all for it, you know, I, I also try to think about myself as a pragmatic, but I also think that Pragmatically, what is happening now is that a lot of people overestimated Russia for past many years and underestimated Ukraine for past years. Uh, and maybe pragmatically, we have to say that maybe not all nations are so um, huge and mighty as we sometimes uh, believe. And uh, um, so I, I would still think that Ukraine deserves a, a spot on, on this big table of negotiation uh, more than. Um, a lot of people used to believe. Okay, um, over. Thank you. Natalia? I would like to uh, add here, uh, so one of the speakers, uh, sorry, I cannot see from here who, uh, who was that, uh, said very correctly about the attempt of uh, Putin to decide for people in Ukraine. And this is, I guess, very fundamental understanding of what's going on and why Ukrainians are so motivated and coordinating and help each other. It's uh, simply because I don't want Putin to decide whether I should live or not, where I should live, what I should think. And I think that uh, I should fight uh, for my right and for the world that uh, basically would not tolerate uh, people killing other people and try to decide for them. Uh, me, for example, and Timothy Brick, we uh, kind of and uh, our family members, we are on the international market and uh, we had the chance, Timofi had the chance to live in uh, Portugal and Spain. Uh, my husband just came back from US specifically to meet the war from here. Um, and uh, we had proposals to live in other countries. So for us, it's not that we kind of uh, need help. We need allies in this idea that nobody should decide for others. And uh, we see actually that uh, many of you are ally uh, with us uh, in that regard. And uh, we together stand against uh, this uh, uh, evil. So I also don't like when we say about, you know, like humanitarian crisis, uh, yeah, I have only one T-shirt, so that's the only thing that I have. I don't have home, but it's not a problem for me. I always live like that. We don't have many possessions. It's, it's not a big problem. I, I can tolerate hunger for many dates. It, it's not an issue. The real issue that uh, humankind should fight against people like Hitler or like Stalin or like Putin because the world gets terrible and it's difficult to live with your own soul, you know, after you tolerate that somebody rapes your daughter. And th that's why we're here, that's why uh, we do everything that we, we can to fight. And I think, I hope, fundamentally, that's why so many people support that, is that because they can see uh, behind all this geopolitics, or oh, Putin is so strong, he has such a strategy. It's bullshit. It's, it's easy to have strategy when you have weapon to kill people. Everyone can have such a strategy and win anything. But I think fundamentally people see that it's not the world where we want to live when we tolerate that. So thank you very much for kind of your understanding what's going on and for uh, being with us in this idea and uh, uh, sharing that. Uh, I echo what Timothy said and many of you that uh, all collaboration and everything that we can do together right now is uh, uh, very important. Very important to move the borders between people in all the sense, like in 
you know, where there's like on customs to make it simpler language and uh, in our minds, how we treat children of our neighbors, uh, no matter whether there are two meters between us or two kilometers. So uh, I feel that we all are much more united as a humankind uh, right now, and we learn a lot uh, about how we all uh, were functioning and how much we were tolerating, not just in Ukraine. There were so many countries where we tolerate hunger, and, but these this are small, there are so many kilometers between us. And I guess we all learned that kilometers don't matter. Like just several hours uh, ago, uh, Sweden, uh, Sweden monitoring uh, noted, uh, re reported in the news that they had uh, f four military f planes from, from Russia. So the distance is also becoming very relative and uh, uh, it's relative for Putin, but it's also relative for us who fight for a better world for uh, our children and for ourselves. Thank you. Natalia, I, I think, um, you know, what you're gesturing toward reflects the enormous strides in the human rights regime that that has been erected over the course you know over the course of the of the 20th century and and forward and our aspirations as a as a human community as a humanitarian oriented community and the idea that we might be moving toward a vision of global welfare that is based more in the individual and in, in human rights than in the nation state. And I think one of the things that is so frightening about the current attack is that it shows how vulnerable the institutions are that support that vision, right, of, of, a, of a more human-centered world. And, and I, um, you know, Justina, I know, I know you study these issues from a perspective of, of security and, and policy. How, how, do you, how do you see this playing out? The problem is, of course, that uh, where is the conflict and where is the war, the ordinary people always suffer the most. Okay, and <clears throat> this is uh, really now the question, how to resolve the, this, uh, this conflict and this war. I don't believe really that the Ukrainian people, they want to be in the war, but I understand that they fight about the, the, their freedom and their dignity and the sovereignty, independence of the state. So now I'm like sitting in the middle between the idealistic view of the world and the realist view of the world, <laughs> like in the middle. <laughs> so my like, like compromise between this is like it should be and how the world it is. Uh, and I understand, I agree, it should be, you know, that the people, they can decide uh, for themselves, but unfortunately, it's not the case because it does not work. The world politics does not work in this way. For the time being, you know, the world is divided on the states, it's like political entities, it's that the, they are the states, and the states are weak, equal under international law, but they're not equal in terms of power. And unfortunately, again, when the great powers especially, they don't agree, the small countries, middle-sized countries, and the people, ordinary people, they suffer a lot. You know, we need to think from the international uh, system and international politics perspective that this is really a conflict that will have huge impact on the international security, not only on the, you know, Ukraine, that's first, absolutely, and Ukrainian people. There is no, no, it's, it's not acceptable to use the military force today between the states, I mean. And again, I thought that we overcome it already in Europe, you know, after the 20th century of two wars that we, it will not happen. But this, this happened, okay? So now what we are going to do and how we are going to resolve it. It will have the huge impact on, again, on the region. It will have the huge impact on security uh, in Europe. We, you know, I talk to students and we discuss in, in the class, for example, um, you know, Security in Europe is understood very broadly. So it's not only military security. It's military that's first. But also we are talking about the refugees. Second, we are talking about the cyber attacks. There is a huge rise of the cyber attacks recently. 
okay, in the European in the European countries. Then we are talking about the different groups and the nationalism in in Europe. Look, the Balkans. This is the fragile region again. Okay, so we are concerned very much that this conflict can also spread on the on the other areas. Now we talk about the international security. And this uh, resolution that you mentioned today, uh, that was not accepted in the Security Council because, uh, you know, Russia, of course, there has the right of veto, it was accepted by the uh, General Assembly. But look who abstained from, the, uh, from, uh, from uh, supporting this. China and in India, they abstain from voting. Okay, so they didn't condemn Russia. So now the case, and the, 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 the question is, so do those countries really condemn Russia? And these are the rising powers, okay? So how it is going to be the international order in the future? Second, uh, another issue that maybe we should consider is like sanction Russia, okay? And European Union sanctioned and the United States sanctioned Russia. But now there is the concern about the food security in the North Africa and the Middle East, because Ukraine and Russia, they produce crops. And especially Ukraine is a very, it's one of the largest exporter of wheat, Russia as well. So Middle, Middle uh, Eastern countries and North Africa countries, they buy okay, crops and wheats, especially from Ukraine and, and Russia. So there is the concern that in Ukraine, there will be no harvest because there is a war. <coughs> Russia will not be able to sell because it's cut from the financial, financial system. From, there is the cut from the SWIFT. So what does it mean for the, for the middle size and, and North African countries, for the societies? In Turkey, so the prices go up, it's a huge inflation. Yeah? And this will also impact on the illegal immigration because the people already, already escape and flee from North Africa, Africa, you know, Middle East. So, what I want to say, it will have a huge consequences, okay, on very different level. And now again, we think, look, what is going on in South China Sea? There is the rivalry between the United States and China that has been going on for years, okay? How now the, the, it will impact the war in Ukraine on this relation? Today, I, I also read about the violation, again, the rise of the violation of human rights and democracy in Tunisia. Because when all eyes of the international community goes to the Eastern Europe and Ukraine, that's absolutely understandable. But then, you know, the <laughs> leaders in the other countries, non-democratic leaders, they use it on their own ben benefits, okay? So that's why I say it's really important to find a solution as, as soon as possible for Ukrainian people, for Central European countries, for Europe, for international, international security and, and stability. And think also about the global, global problems, okay? Climate change, uh, COVID-19. Have we talked recently about those problems? This is what we, what we need to focus, all of us. And how can we cooperate as international community, okay? On the climate change, that needs to, and it's really need to have the global governance if there, is a, if there is a war between when the great power or rising great power, whatever how we call Russia, it's involved in the conflict, okay? So this is really <laughs> concern on a very, very different dimension. I know that it's not optimistic view, but <laughs> maybe this, yeah, more realistic view. <laughs> Well, D Tim, do you want to expand on that a little bit? I mean, I know you've written before on the on the continued um, vitality of the nation state, even even in the face of globalization and in the face of of shared challenges. What what do you see happening here? Yeah, it's, uh, thanks. Um, just to, as a starting point, uh, Tunisia voted for the uh, uh, the uh, resolution. I take your point on. Um, I do think it's important. One thing Elizabeth mentioned, I, I, I completely agree with. I, I, we are in a much more multipolar world. Um, I, I think that actually is is one of the most disturbing elements of this. It's true. It's not uh, just Moscow and and uh, uh, Washington anymore. 
but, but that is the circumstance which we find ourselves in an increasingly fragmented uh, multipolar world with multiple actors that, that matter. Um, and it's precisely because of that that this kind of crisis has become more possible, uh, uh, that, that this has happened. That's not to blame NATO expansion. That's just to think about the structure in which this kind of event is more likely than it would have been uh, back in the bad old days of, uh, of a bipolar division, which we are not returning to. We're going to have a much more uh, complex one, I fear. Uh, Taiwan is a wonderful example of, we think about nation states or states, um, uh, it, but a complex one, and I fear we will be back on this, uh, this podium in the next five to 10 years um, to talk about uh, that conflict, because of course China is, is at least likely to be one of the great winners out of this particular conflict in terms of its uh, increased uh, 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 geopolitical power and, and position. Um, I, I do think the, I, th I think the state's decline has been greatly exaggerated over time, and, and that really does play into this question. It's what I'll be talking about tomorrow in the last day of our teaching is how we should think about the relationship of state and nation in a place like Ukraine after the violence has, has ended. Um, uh, and, and to me, it, it, it's, you know, I'm reminded of something, uh, I think it's Ingrid Wirth from Vanderbilt just wrote, uh, uh, you, you mentioned this idea of the, the deepening of human rights and so forth over decades, which is true. Uh, we have a, a very different set of global norms than we used to. She made a very interesting kind of provocative argument that that very process has in some ways contributed to the degradation of the thin core agreement around not... Um, threatening the territory of state. That is to say, the increased intrusion into previously internal sovereign affairs somehow has related to, uh, along with the decline of, uh, of bipolarism, uh, to uh, uh, degradation of the norm against aggression and use of force across borders. It's a really interesting idea, um, uh, and it, it's also a, a fairly a fairly grim one, I, I fear. But I do think uh, what's right about it is that in some sense, um, we have uh, uh, arrived at a place where we, we are imagining the decline of the state, but, but in a way that doesn't really match uh, a, a geopolitical reality. We have a really thin understanding of what is the justification for the states we have. It's only defense of their territory, and, and we don't ever inquire as to why a state makes sense. If we, if we move to the should, in other words, the internal democratic questions, on which, which I agree is an internal matter of states, why a state has the qualities it does, the territory it does, the populations it does, all of that's been thinned out of our system in favor of a commitment to defending the units that we've got. And that's what I think is interesting about this, about this Professor Worth's argument, that the reintroduction or the attempt to introduce values about human rights and so forth in ever greater uh, 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 elements of the, of the system is pushing against that core commitment. And here we're seeing a, a crisis that um, challenges that. Uh, the, what I want to suggest is I'm the optimistic view, if I wanted to cross to optimism for a moment, which a place I rarely mm -hmm. occupy, um, maybe we're seeing in the votes in the UN and so forth, uh, and in just the response more generally, maybe we are seeing a, a kind of convergence, a reconvergence on the values of defending against uh, aggression violence as a solution for problems. I, I fear that's not the case, though. I think if you look at the votes today and you look at the responses, they are much more accurately explained through pretty old-fashioned power calculations. Why states voted the way they did has less to do with moral shock than their position in the world, which means you can expect that this alliance is not a new values convergence. It's an alliance of interest, and it will collapse within a year, whenever the events require it, and we'll be back much too more to a normal geopolitical logic. That's, again, depressing as a human being, but I, I feel that's it's more accurate. One of, one of the things we know is that the international system is prone to major cataclysms in which its entire fundamental principles change very rapidly. In, in the summer of 1987, when I graduated from high school, the Soviet Union was going to last forever. And if you had said then that the Soviet Union was weak enough to collapse in a four-year period and that the entire Cold War order would be reshuffled, I think no one would have believed it. So I, I believe we're again at the moment of a major shakeup in which there are so many competing power interests that we don't know the 
the, the structure of the international order that will emerge from this crisis, it will be different than the one we walked in with. Although I, I think one of the, you know, one of the challenges, one of the risks perhaps of, of this crisis occurring at this moment is it comes on the heels of a quite significant shift toward authoritarianism in regimes that, that we used to think were safely <laughs> on the side of, of uh, dem you know, democracy and, and rule of law. And, and I, it, again, it, it, does, it, it, it does seem to be a moment of significant fragility in, in the international order in that, in that sense. I'm trying to think of a way to turn this conversation toward a more... <laughs> so Elizabeth, tell us about the humanitarian side of this. So I know that you're on your way to Poland, I, I believe, soon. I'm leaving next week for the yeah. Polish-Ukrainian border. Yeah, and so, so what, are, what are you seeing from the organizations you work with and the, and the groups you're working with? Yeah, one of the interesting things that has happened um, is how slow the response has been from international organizations. It, it, usually they're on site within days. And this time, the IOM just landed last night. Uh, what are we in, day five of the war? Um, so uh, UNHCR has had a very limited presence. That's the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. So we're definitely seeing um, the f uh, an enormous challenge to the international humanitarian system, which is premised around these um, international NGOs and international organizations. In, in a country which is much weaker, these um, organizations, UNHCR, USAID, Doctors Without Borders, come in and they take over the functions of the state in many ways. When Doctors Without Borders rolls in, it unpacks a hospital. It's not interfacing with the local medical system at all. It's, it's completely isolated. The same with the World Food Program, which sort of pops in and starts delivering food without reference to the local food system. And we, we aren't seeing that here because, precisely because this is Europe and these are countries which are saying that they themselves don't need that replacement for state functions. So we're starting to see some real jostling between international organizations, international humanitarian organizations, states like Poland, um, international organizations like the European Union. And I think that that power balance has not worked, has not been clearly worked out right now. But right now, yesterday when I, when I went to sleep, 300,000 people had left Ukraine. And when I woke up this morning, 660,000 people had left Ukraine. It is the highest refugee flow we have seen since World War II in terms of rate of people moving. It, it is entirely possible if this war continues that we'll see four or five million people leave Ukraine and double that number displaced inside Ukraine. I don't know, I, I mean, I know we can't crowdsource a response at that scale. Um, and I don't know who can provide a response at that scale. Or, or Timothy, um, you know, we've we've touched, and Elizabeth just touched again on on the fact that this is Europe, right? And and that the EU also is there, and Zelensky is is promoting you know, accession to the EU, how, how is that, is that, how's that conversation unfolding on the ground right now? Is, is there a discussion of, of what it would mean to have membership in the EU and have that help through this immediate crisis, but then, then also more, more durably, or is, is this not a, a focal point of the conversation on the ground right now? Well, um, you know, just observing some media discourses and uh, um, talking to my colleagues and uh, some members of civil society, from my perspective, it has now a very strong conversations about European Union and joining the EU. Uh, these conversations, they have very strong uh, influence on attitudes and morale of people so this is a very nice symbolic gesture just you know to support people to to make them feel more united and more 
supported by Europe. But I don't think that right now this is a focal point for um, you know for many people who are just staying in their basements or uh, thinking about um, military advances. I think a lot of people are more concerned about either sanctions to Russia or, or military support or humanitarian aid. And uh, conversation about European Union uh, definitely has attracted a lot of attention, but more from the perspective of you know moral support and symbolism. I don't know, maybe maybe Natalia can add something. Um, yeah, Timothy, I would uh, agree with you. So, firstly, so there are there is no you know fundamental reason. Um, for me as an economist to say why Ukraine should not be in EU. So, uh, and right now it's really very symbolic in the sense that it shows unity. Practically speaking, uh, the imports and uh, exports, so the trade that is mostly affected uh, by the uh, like, uh, practical or pragmatic uh, rules in the EU, it's uh, not really like happening. So 60% of trade of Ukraine is happening through the sea normally. It's not happening right now. Uh, everything going through the borders and it's mostly, you know, uh, imports to Ukraine, but not uh, exports to EU, which is, you know, usually the point for trade negotiations how much you can export and uh, what are the terms for that and prices. So um, practically it, there is no like big uh, influence right now, uh, but still um, I think maybe some bureaucracy might be removed uh, if we go further even in, in this direction. Um, so I, I'm, in fact I'm grateful for the European uh, politicians uh, that uh, they accepted Ukrainian call for the membership. And uh, for me, it's uh, as uh, like person right now in Ukraine, it's uh, a signal of uh, um, a signal that uh, these politicians at least and their constituency, they uh, consider Ukrainians as the same people as they are and also see us uh, as uh, uh, Euro Europeans as uh, we are, so that's very healthy uh, process, uh, I would say. Um, given that we touched upon trade, uh, I will comment uh, on the comment made uh, by one of the speakers about food security. Uh, this is uh, indeed a big issue. Uh, Ukraine exports, um, so the, fi the final uh, consumers of Ukrainian um, food exports are more than 300 million people uh, all over the world, mostly in the uh, Middle East, uh, in uh, um, Africa, in Europe, uh, but also in China, for example. And uh, uh, for example, and, and, and the Ukraine is a very big player in Chinese market, specifically in uh, crops uh, that are consumed uh, by animals, you know, that are then fed for meat. So the, in China would also uh, feel this effect, and uh, Russia, uh, who is also playing on this market, would not be able to substitute for that. So that's very correct observation, uh, that unless uh, the uh, military actions um, stop on the territory of uh, Ukraine, on the fields, the fields on the farms before the like actual spring, when farmers usually start uh, uh, start their kind of business process, uh, then uh, there is a huge uh, risk for the food security in the region, and uh, yeah, that should be that should be thought about. Of course, uh, um, I, I want to think that people care, people in Europe care about my life, not only because we have farms, but because of other reasons too. But uh, at the same time, I would not feel better if somebody in 
Middle East would uh, suffer without food. Uh, so that should be indeed taken uh, into consideration and taken uh, care of. Thank you, over. Um, I, I think what I would suggest, because I, there may be questions from the audience, I think, for these distinguished panelists. So why don't we do one round just along the row here for, for one more intervention comment from, from the panelists and then um, open it up to questions from the floor? Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, I kind of second my colleagues from Kiev and almost uh, in everything that they said. And um, um, I think that uh, yeah, the conversations uh, in the Western countries and uh, uh, in the US, I mean, in Europe and in the US, uh, often. Um, uh, are about uh, kind of the, or not often, but sometimes, um, focus on justification of certain uh, Putin's actions, like, for example, invasion of a different sovereign country uh, with his, I don't know, fears or whatever his uh, psychological problems, issues, or uh, like real geopolitical threat that he is facing. And that's, of course, is unsettling to many people who are from Ukraine because we are being seen in this scenario as just uh, like uh, being in between um, these uh, two forces and not being able to decide for ourselves and not being able to protect ourselves. But uh, I think that in addition to that, it's, it's, not, it's not only that. And uh, I think that um, this idea of... Uh, uh, threat that uh, Putin used to justify uh, his attack uh, on Ukraine um, is was also other things that influenced it is also the fact that he doesn't recognize uh, Ukraine as a sovereign country per se. <laughs> so I think it has a very long history uh, and it has a very long um, history in relationships between these two countries and uh, the fact that he doesn't see Ukrainian people as uh, having a right to uh, decide for themselves is also part of the problem. I know now I'm kind of entering this, again, these grounds of uh, moral uh, morals, but I think that that's a problem as well. And uh, we should, if we are thinking about imperialism and we're fighting with imperialism, we shouldn't kind of justify imperialism in any form, even if this imperialism is using, uh, for example, anti-fascist, anti-Western rhetorics, because uh, the ways that Putin uses them is completely um, ruining the meaning of uh, uh, this kind of ideas. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted maybe to add this to the discussion that... Uh, I feel that um, kind of saying that a any justification that he did that because of the threat that he feels from Western countries or NATO, or he did that because he is uh, fighting with, I don't know, some imagined uh, fascists in his own head. Um, all of that is just a um, very weak excuse for, for imperialistic war, for waging imperialistic war. And I have no uh, doubts that that's an imperialistic war because uh, it has a very long history in relationships between our two countries. And this approach to us as not being, um, not having the right to be a separate people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I will, um, as someone focusing on Russia, I'll bring it back uh, to Russia for a second and make two points, one about the media and other about the academic community, something that Timofey touched upon, so I wanted to sort of uh, pick up on that or, or respond to that. Uh, one is, the first point is sort of a, a corrective uh, to my own a grim picture that I drew earlier, um, uh, in which I, to remind, just said that, you know, the, the TV is, uh, which is totally controlled by the state and which, uh, 
is you know given people basically like parallel uh, reality picture um, uh, complete sort of madness um, and the the internet which is much freer but is still the, where the discourse is still to a great degree shaped or defined by the the state frames and narratives um, which is the so the the more positive note on which I want to leave you is that um, there are still sources to go to, and importantly, this time around, much more so than in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea, etc., we're seeing a lot of um, celebrities, for example, being outspokenly against what's going on. Uh, Russia's uh, most famous, most popular TV host addressed his, uh, you know, 10 million followers on Instagram with a very direct uh, post. I think it just literally said no to the war. Russia's number one and very popular YouTube personality who has 5.5 million followers on Instagram also um, addressed his followers. And so a lot, of, uh, a lot of people, a lot of celebrities, a lot of famous people are openly coming out against it, uh, which is again a, a shift from 2014 when there were some people um, uh, speaking out against it, but not, not so prominently or not such prominent people. Uh, we are also hearing reports or seeing people doing it publicly of quitting state media. Um, it's not uh, large enough to say that it's an exodus, at least not yet. But again, this is not something, this is not a phenomenon that I, I recall from 2014. Uh, and I mean state, you know, state media. So there are some signs that are um, I suppose positive in this overall uh, not greatest, to say the least, you know, media environment or media reality in which uh, Russians exist, um, and this is, I guess, something something uh, hopeful to 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 look forward to and to follow and and see if that if that um, little stream of people, let's say, quitting those organizations, indeed turns into a, into an exodus or not. Um, I doubt it, but 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 we'll see. And so the uh, the second point about the academic community, I'm originally from Russia. I have you know um, a large network of my colleagues and friends who are now um, academics or still or, or or have become since uh, academics in Russia. And I think it's a very it's a tough question of 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 how not to support, let's say, the Russian state while still supporting the academics because. The academics, I would argue here, or, or a lot of them at least, or the ones that I know, and they count, you know, the, we're talking about dozens, hundreds, thousands per, perhaps of people. Um, I, I see themselves, I see them as, you know, as, as victims of, of all of this and not as perpetrators of all of this, because the ones that I know are out there protesting, either in the streets and getting, you know, beaten and, and taken to police custody, or protesting at least online, uh, or writing petitions, or initiating petitions against what's going on. And so to me, they are not, you know, they're not the culprits. They're not to, to, to punish. And it is a tough question because, you know, we're sitting here in one of the great, you know, American public institutions, but there are a lot of private institutions or universities here in the States. That's not the case in Russia. Uh, the, you know, the higher, the, the academy, the, the higher education is um, almost entirely uh, state funded. It's, it's all state institutions. So those very, you know, kind of liberal uh, or, um, uh, friends of mine, they all work, even if they completely disagree with the with the state and publish and speak against what the state is doing. They all work for state institutions, and so, you know, I, it is it is a tough question. And I, I'm already knowing, I'm already seeing the funds and the uh, collaborative programs between, let's say, Germany and Russia. Actually, one program between Germany and Russia and Ukraine, which was on memory politics and which was devoted, which was started after 2014 and was devoted precisely to bringing together. Um, uh, people, you know, academics, uh, academic communities from Ukraine and Russia uh, and working together, you know, shut down immediately. And um, I don't know if that's the answer. I, you know, to me, that's not the answer. These are not the people, if anything, these are the people who need more support, not less support, because this is one of the last free uh, or the last remaining spaces where people, um, intellectuals, are speaking out against what's, what's happening. Um, and so, you know, I don't know for a fact, but I doubt that IU uh, gets its, or had its, you know, ties cut with the world when, you know, US invaded Iraq or Afghanistan or is bombing Yemen. So if that's the case here, then I think, you know, um, we need to think about the knee jerk reaction of pulling basically the carpet under the people who are actually, um, I believe deserve support and not um, condemnation while recognizing that it's a tough question when they're formally working for a state institution such as uh, uh, almost all universities are in Russia. 
I think the comment I'd like to make is about what's going to happen to the refugees that are pouring into Western Europe right now. And we, one of the things that we see very often in, in refugee crises is that there's first a huge outpouring of support and truckloads of used clothes and lots of people coming to pass out granola bars to the refugees. And then pretty soon people start to get fatigued and they get tired of having these people hanging around. They get tired of having them sitting in their squares and their parks. They get tired of seeing refugees in their apartment buildings. And then you see the rumors start going that the refugees are violent, that they're dirty, that, they are, that they're carrying diseases. You will see this happen to Ukrainians. Right now, everyone is, is lauding the fact that they're being treated so well because they're white and they're Christian. And it is true, they have gotten a welcome that, that um, other groups have not gotten. The Rohingya have, have never gotten such a response. But I think that that welcome and that categorization of them as, as white Christian Europeans is going to fade quickly. And when those rumors start going around, that starts to play into the hands of, of pro-authoritarian right-wing political movements. And so I really, you know, I worry very much about the kinds of threats that those right-wing mov movements and their ability to mobilize hatred, to mobilize anger, I worry about the risk that those play to the Western democracies, including ours. So I encourage you, when, when the pushback starts, and it will, um, take a moment and make sure you push back on the pushback with facts and with compassion. So when I think about this uh, conflict, I'm always now thinking, what is the best way to resolve it and how to resolve it, okay? And as fast as possible. Uh, after the conflict, uh, there is always the building the peace, and it will take time, especially after these bloody events that are going on now. So I'm thinking, okay, what, what is the best solution for this, for this conflict? And I'm thinking, you know, um, leaders, uh, policymakers, they see the world differently. There, is, there are no really so... There are facts, and they're the perception of facts and the interpretation of facts. And maybe we should start to try to understand what is really about uh, and what is the perception, especially with the what does Russia want and what is behind of this, uh, of this attack, because there is many interpretation and theory. What, what is really, what does the Kremlin want? And I don't know, is any one of us really know what is the, the point and what is the strategic goal of, uh, of uh, the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin and what is the end of this, of this situation. And I also think, you know, the, the, about the national identity, how the societies, they behave, and especially about, about Russia and how much is the culturally rooted, um, the perception of the world. So, like, uh, if you tomorrow we have in the Polish Study Center the lecture about the political messianism in uh, in Russia and the contemporary Russia. Maybe this is also another point to understand what is what, what is really going on. At least to try to understand to find the to find the solution. So, yeah, I, I would like to encourage also you to think, okay, how to resolve and how to finish this conflict as soon as possible. Just uh, two points, and the first, I'm, I'm happy to, I think, agree with Elizabeth about this on refugees. Um, it was asked earlier, uh, what possible solution can there be if this truly becomes one of the largest ways of refugees since the war? And, and it's clearly got to be Europe, it, the institutions of Europe and the states of Europe that will have the resources to do this. And, and perhaps the optimistic view, I think, um, that they might also have the will. And this somehow relates, of course, to as Elizabeth said, um, some identification, right? Identity and shared values that are not global, but are particular regional uh, and, and particularly European. Um, and, and there's a certain irony in this, of course, uh, I think the last time I was on this stage was for the uh, panel on the European migration crisis five, six years ago. Um, and I'm going next week to a conference on migration in Berlin. It's on uh, 
plan before this on migration between Europe and Africa, there are going to be some very um, uh, angry and ironic questions about the different response, in, at least in this early phase, before the bitterness and, and resentment and backlash sets in about how it is that um, uh, refugees are treated in a different crisis. Second point, quickly, um, uh, 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 I was arguing earlier that um, uh, you know, an essential component of the resolution of this crisis in whichever direction will be the intervention of major external powers, and I believe that is true. Uh, it is also true, I think, um, that the, the surprisingly robust Ukrainian resistance inside the country, military and civil resistance, um, is, is essential, I think, to the formation and the maintenance of that external coalition of, of actors. I do not think we would have seen the level of sanctions and support today if the, if the government had capitulated quickly, right? This is not just about moral outrage. These are actors voting and acting, uh, uh, taking steps against Russia because they see a prospect that Russia's will actually uh, uh, fail. Uh, and had this been a quick decapitation, I suspect we would have had uh, a tenth of the response and the, the outrage. The, the resistance itself is essential to the external uh, essential intervention. I couldn't agree more, Tim, and that's what really gives me hope. And I will say, um, this didn't come out of nowhere. You know, we had 2014 with Russia annexing Crimea, stirring up separatism in the East, setting up sham republics. Um, I'm glad the world's paying attention. I'm sorry it took too long, and I'm sorry it took this war for that to happen. Um, it's shameful. I've said enough, and I want to cede my time to our colleagues in Kiev, and I want to thank all of my uh, fellow panelists for making the time uh, to come here this evening and for all your contributions this entire week in the teach-in. It's been amazing to see the IU community come around, um, coalesce around um, this, uh, this war and support Ukraine and its people. So um, especially thank you, Timothy and uh, Natalia. It's almost 2 a.m. where you are. You've got to be exhausted. And uh, thank you so much for spending your time with us. Do you have final comments? Uh, I guess I just want to say thank you on behalf of our organization, but also Ukrainians. We feel your support, uh, your support, and I mean, the support of the government, the support of intellectuals and uh, ordinary citizens, we feel it. Uh, and um, we will be grateful for um, you know, if, if you just keep going. So please support us and we will support you in this fight against, uh, against Putin, because Ukraine now stands in between of Putin and, um, and the free world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, uh, yeah, so all your attention to what's going on and uh, all your attempts to see what's true and to tell it to your community is uh, very important, uh, so we are allies in that, uh, so yeah, keep, keep going please, that's uh, very important for us. Thank you, and again, thank you so much for, for your incredible generosity in, in, joining us, in joining us today. And I would invite questions from the audience. Evening. Um, so in Russia right now, we can see that there's a lot of separation still uh, on behalf of like how people view Putin and his uh, regime. So there are people who are still supportive. The, of course, there are people who are who were and still kind of dismiss the whole situation. They don't really care, and there are people who are strictly against. And uh, honestly, can we, can we see like the whole regime just start crumbling down from the inside? And uh, if, if that is to happen, how quick do you think this could happen? Who would like to feel that one? Yeah. <laughs> We're looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> Pass. 
<laughs> I'll pass on any predictions um, after the events of last week, which I think very few people um, could predict. Um, I um, Unfortunately, I don't, I think the support is from, well, first of all, we don't know for sure. Um, we didn't know, it, it's hard to tell for sure, even under the sort of quote unquote normal circ authoritarian circumstances. Um, in the current cir circumstances, it's even harder to uh, get any uh, trustworthy data, let's say. Um, but unfortunately, um, I think is that the 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 mass uh, the popular support is still there. Um, I know we're getting a lot of again leaks, reports, insider reports that this came as a surprise to most in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in the presidential administration, in a lot of uh, state media even that perhaps maybe a tiny circle knew, but even within the elite, broadly speaking, or like the decision making community, people are in complete shock and and just you know, are saying what the hell is going on. Um, but as to whether that's going to lead to some, you know, coup, you know, elite coup or, or popular uprising. So definitely I would not um, look forward to a popular uprising. I don't think that's happening. I, my understanding, at least from what I'm seeing, is, is that it's very much, uh, uh, I don't have the numbers, but definitely, you know, the majority. It's not, there's not going to be... Um, or at least I wouldn't anticipate, because again, who knows? You know, no one predicted the Russian Revolution at the time, et cetera. So yeah, uh, but but the the, the 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 support for the regime, the popular support, is still very much there. This, at least so far, I don't know if we can attribute it all to the control of mass media, you know, or not. But um, people aren't on mass going like, oh my God, like what you know, what is what is this? What is going on? A lot of people are. Believing this, buying into this, you know, just like the um, the tweet that I began my 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 first comment with, um, which said, right, think of your uh, American, British, Canadian uncle, you know, conspiracy theorist uncle. They have all the access to the information, and yet they believe that. So, unfortunately, I think that's very much still the case. Yeah, I just wanted to add a very short point that I think that people have been prepared. At uh, and during the last eight years, they have been trained to think in a certain way in Russia, I mean. So I think that uh, media in Russia works really well to form this image of Ukraine that is really like demonic and is like uh, almost absurd that a country like that can exist with all this evil and awful people there that we should protect ourselves from. So I think that people are so kind of emotionally um, involved in that in Russia, that I don't see how they could protest decision like even starting a war. I'm surprised that they're hiding what they're doing so much because I feel like they could really present it in a really nice light uh, and even gain some support um, from that because of the way that they portray who they're fighting with. Uh, and that these people that they're fighting with, I mean, Ukrainians, or like that they call them nationalists, they don't really say Ukrainians anymore, I think, Ukrainian nationalists. Uh, yeah, or Ukrainian radical nationalists, etc. This is how they call, uh, <laughs> it seems like they call the whole population of Ukraine was this word. Um, so the way that they were portrayed uh, in the media gives, uh, uh, all kind of people who watch this media, these TV channels, um, kind of a, a satisfaction from the fact that the evil is going to be punished. Well, at least I get this feeling when I watch Russian media. Uh, so I think it's like uh, like a crusade that is uh, that Russia has a mission. It's on a mission to kind of free the world from evil. So I, I don't think it's going to um, end up in uh, uh, taking... Uh, the, taking the regime uh, or kind of uh, undermining the regime in any way. I just, what I see from the way that, from my position is that it, it's in many ways only supporting the regime in, yeah, because it was, it started with uh, Maidan and the way it was portrayed in the media, then it, uh, the people were uh, already at that point, they were kind of told all of this um, stories, uh, fake stories about Ukraine and then uh, it continued in Crimea, and then it continued with the annexation, not annexation, but occupation, basically, of Donbass. And so now people are really well prepared to take this, I think. 
I think there was a question up here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, may I ask uh, two questions? Or, um, okay. Um, so my first one, we were like in the beginning of the conversation, we were talking about some like good, um, like reliable and like up to date news sources uh, in the Ukraine or Ukraine, excuse me. Um, and I was wondering if you could like share with us maybe a couple of those so we could all of those as well. So I think this might be either for Sarah or for um, Natalia and Timothy. Are, are there some specific news sources from within Ukraine that we can be consulting? Yeah, so uh, in English, I'm assuming is more convenient <laughs> for people, but that would be um, the Kiev Independent is a good uh, source. Also, Ukrainska Pravda, Ukrainian Truth, um, has English uh, language uh, coverage. Um, there are others. I'd invite my colleagues from Kiev and uh, Polina and anyone else to, to offer your, um, your recommendations. Yeah, they're pretty much the same. So it's, if something important happens, then Kiev Independent will be the first to report it in English. And you will see the same news on uh, Ukrainska Pravda. I just, as a consumer, uh, I, I, I like, I used to read a lot of uh, media called Babi. And now it, it used to be uh, media, a mixed bag of politics, economics, and culture, but now it's only about war. So, <laughs> you, you, Kiev Independent will be enough, I think. Okay, uh, that's great. Uh, my second one is a little bit longer. I was um, wondering if you could, if one of y'all could um, give us any insight into maybe uh, what might happen or is happening in eastern Ukraine, because I feel like that's a part that's a little less talked about, especially because it's all about like the fighting in the major cities now. Um, especially maybe what the resolution might look like, like it will those like uh, sham republics like be totally dislodged, or if it's a quicker resolution, would that be totally off the table? Like really anything to help us understand it, maybe. Well, I, I will say that my original thought was that um, the Russians would use the same strategy they've deployed in, in Georgia and South Ossetia, which is to occupy a breakaway territory, to turn it into a forward military base, to show that they have the capacity for a full-on invasion, and then sit back and know that they can control the the rump government of Georgia or of Ukraine simply by continually threatening invasion. And I would have said, I did say that last week, but um, it looks now like they're going um, for a solution which is not like the South Ossetian one, but certainly more like the Syrian one, which is not good. So I don't know what the resolution is. I keep hoping that they'll agree to pull back to Donbass set up an administrative boundary line, and then we'll have another frozen conflict. But I don't know that that's a tenable resolution anymore. OK, uh, thanks, everybody. So there were comments made about um, the imperialistic nature of the narratives being put forth in discussions about um, the conflict itself, as well as the imperialistic nature of Russia's actions itself. So I'm curious if any of you have thoughts or comments on, on the imperialism that exists within NATO. Um, I think it was kind of going along with that. Biden said um, that this conflict is showing us the importance of NATO and the safety it offers us. And I'm curious if you all agree with that statement or if you think it's maybe showing the opposing and showing how the Cold War rhetoric and paranoia still exists in our world order today and if NATO poses any future threats to us as well with um, kind of the way that it's uh, mixing up international relations now. That's a nice softball maybe for the middle of the panel here. Tim, Justina, would you like to tackle that? Um, uh, I, th I think the paranoia exists for good reason, uh, I suppose. Um, uh, so I don't know that I accept the premise that 
NATO is imperial in that way. But I, of course, the one was the one earlier <laughs> indirectly defending um, imperialism, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a tricky ground. Um, but I would say, you know, NATO. Let me. I'll, I'll, I'll take the premise, right? NATO's imperialism is is a much more voluntaristic kind, and this has been true of the American imperium since the war. It has a different quality than the old-fashioned ones that it didn't always take the territory, right? But rather gain control. And this is an important distinction, not always, but 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 often. Uh, and one element of that now, I think, people have long debated what is the point of NATO since the end of the Cold War. Though I would note your imperialist concerns predate that, presumably. Um, and I think this goes back to the paranoia. Um, uh, I, I think what this crisis is doing, and, and to, the, uh, to the degree this was one of Putin's goals, and I don't know, but if it, people often think that it was about weakening NATO, he clearly has failed at that. And I think, I think you would find if we were to poll European decision makers now, they're really focused clearly on how important this is to them, right? Much more so. Germany just practically doubled its investment, right? So there, there's the imperialism and the paranoia all wrapped together in a, in a response to, to reinforce the values. And I think accurately, again, it's, it's not a question of whether these are defensive alliances or not. This is part of the, the realist logic of a security dilemma. Putin is right that NATO threatens Russia. It is nonsense that it's a defensive alliance only. There is no such thing. That's not in the nature of these alliances. They can have intentionality, but their existence creates you know, a threat in being. And, and true in the other direction. So the, 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 to my mind, that, that paranoia is simply becoming clarified now. It has been a risk that has been there. In some sense, has become worse because of the multipolarity of our system. And we're seeing it play out. This is not to excuse the invasion, but to explain it as a thing that was more predictable, and this is, in a sense, I would agree and from an indirect route with those who've been saying we should have been more responsive in the past. This has been coming for a long time, and we've had many signals, because this is now the third time that a kind of encroachment has happened, uh, but also, uh, from the Russian point of view, an encroachment against, a, what I called in an op-ed recently, part of the counterattack against uh, NATO's eastward expansion. Right? And th 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 these paranoias, in other words, are, are quite rational. One thing to add, uh, again, I don't, it's about the perception, how the leaders, they perceive the world, and uh, like, for example, how the Russia and the Kremlin perceive. Uh, there was the national security strategy of Russia adopted last year. So if you read this, for example, you will see that the language that is used in this in this national security strategy is very defensive. So Russia perceives, yeah, the Western countries, uh, NATO, US, they are unfriendly towards Russia. There is the threat towards Russia. Well, where there is paranoid, again, I said, this is about the perception. This is how Russia perceives. Based, again, on the historical experience, we may agree with this, we may criticize it, we may say, yes, this is paranoid, but again, this is about the perception, how the world is, how the, how the world is perceived. Yeah. If you look at this from the perspective of Georgia or Ukraine or Moldova or even Poland, um, they have always had an interesting problem, which is that they're in this zone between empires which have expansionist tendencies, right? So we also, I often call this the crumple zone of empire, like the crumple zone in a car, right? Where the idea is that it takes all the brunt of the clashes between empires while the empires themselves don't face war on their own territory. So if you're Georgia or Ukraine, that's a super bad position to be in, right? And, and so I think that they're, if you look at their political behavior over the last three centuries, it's been always a question of playing one empire off against another, hoping that you don't end up in the middle between a clash. And so they are pursuing their own, um, their, what they see as their own defensive interests in wanting to join NATO because they have uh, obviously very realistic fear of being overrun by Russia. And, and so they're trying to leverage these two empires against one another um, and we can see in Ukraine that that strategy uh, has failed. Add a little bit. Um, I just wanted to add um, 
Justina mentioned the last year's um, security, right, you said, or military doctrine, and I wanted to uh, go further back, and so I'm not gonna say my opinion, whether it's imperialistic or not, but, but speaking, uh, sort of getting into the minds of the, the Russian elites or the Russian governing elites, um, I just wanted to stretch it back into into the 90s, especially the early 90s, for example, which were the most you know liberal, Western-oriented, sort of Euro-Atlanticist few years in Russia's history, and probably will be for a long time. Um, and both the doctrine of 97 and the foreign policy concept of 93 um, frame it in basically the same way. They're not hostile, so the language is more, uh, it's not as sort of as aggressive as hostile, but the in ninety in the doctrine the foreign policy doctrine of ninety three, uh, which was passed and and crafted again during the the foreign minister was one of the most sort of um, Europhiles or Western files in, in Russian history, um, and it said that it warned against and I quote from memory, but it, the wording definitely was uh, kind of. A warning, like we're warning against uh, the neo-imperialistic tendencies of the United States that might, um, you know, try to go back to the Cold War, um, and we are calling for a multipolar world. So I just want to um, say that in the minds of Russian government elites, that's definitely the case. Uh, to them, this is kind of a, an a imperialistic encroachment. And the key point that I'm trying to make is this is not it, Putin's. Um, uh, methods are, you know, that those of you know of a madman. But the general logic and the general perception um, of these kind of geopolitical structures um, has been there since day one of new, let's say, independent Russia. Even if it was from a, a kind of a liberal perspective, and saying that we are against this new new imperialism of the United States because we are also very, you know, because we also want to be a liberal democracy, we want to be an equal partner, we want to be embraced by the West, right? So from a very different standpoint than today, where it's all about, no, like, we are different from you, you are corrupt, immoral, what, what have you, but the logic of we don't want your, you know, you to be an empire, or we perceive you as an empire, and we perceive your expansion as an empire, that has been there even under the most liberal administration from day one um, in 1992. Uh, and I think that's an important historical trajectory or prehistory to this to remember when we, while, you know, I also consider this Putin's war in the methods he chose, but, but those broader logic, I think, cannot be and should not be reduced um, to Putin alone. Thank you. And I think there was, was there a question up here? Yes. Hello. <laughs> um, I just wanted to go back, I guess, to the conversation of the humanitarian efforts and, you know, the improvement of, like, acceptance of refugees. Um, and I guess I would like to say, I would say that the large amount and, like, the flow of refugees and the major acceptance, instead, like, rather than being an example of improvement, I think it's a kind of a highlights one of the major flaws, um, the biggest flaws in humanitarian, like, <laughs> crises past is um, just racism. And so I wanted to, um, you were giving examples like, oh, in the later, um, I guess, later, like in, you know, the continuation of the crisis, it's, uh, there's going to be, you know, stereotypes, um, just negative images made. But um, I kind of want to circle back to the African refugees that are in Ukraine currently, or just black Ukrainians or non-white Ukrainians. Um, so what is the end goal for them, like, for the, in the case of them? Is the support going to be prolonged for white Ukrainians um, because of the existence of, like, the African immigrants that are seeking, you know, refuge, um, that are being segregated at the border of Poland, um, that, were brought, that were in Ukraine due to their academic status? So I'm... Guess, I guess I'm trying to bring into that, in that narrative into this conversation. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about um, differential treatment for people, people who were holding um, passports from African countries versus people who were um, holding Ukrainian identity documents. And, um, and 
it, it's clearly racism. I mean, you cannot deny the fact that there were people, and it was on the Ukrainian side, by the way. I mean, the all the verified accounts of this are on the Ukrainian side. That they were pulling um, Nigerians and Moroccans off buses and saying, Ukrainians first. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's straight up xenophobia and racism. Um, what I do know is that when those folks got to the Polish border, they were admitted into Poland. And the posts I've seen on Twitter from people who were in, in groups of African students traveling is that they've received equal humanitarian aid to everybody else once they uh, cross the Polish border. So that's encouraging. But I think, um, I think there's this issue about, about different, different kinds of Ukrainian residents and how they're going to be treated. Um, and it's hard to say right now what, what, if there'll be any systematic differences there. I would imagine there will be, but I'm not sure what the, what the governments of um, Nigeria or Morocco will be also doing about aid. So in terms of just outcomes, it's hard to say. The bigger question is about um, the racial segregation of different kinds of refugees inside Europe in a larger sense, so not just people who are in, in Europe. And we've seen that already. The German government preferentially admitted Syrians who were highly educated and who could be um, brought into the German workforce. They um, turned back Afghans and they absolutely resolutely turned back Africans. Um, and, the, and, and the European Union continues to pay the government of Libya to conduct interdiction. I, by the way, I use the phrase government of Libya very loosely. Um, insofar as there is a government of, of Libya, um, they're paying warlords to keep refugees from entering international waters. So I think there absolutely is a racial and ethnic hierarchy. There is, that's very clear in, in European um, refugee admissions. It's also clear here, by the way, just in case you haven't noticed that the way we treat, <laughs> the way we treat, I'm sure you've noticed, the way we treat Guatemalans approaching the U.S.-Mexico border, the way we treat Afghans being airlift lifted in, and the way we will treat Ukrainians when they are admitted, and we will admit Ukrainians, Biden has said, those groups are treated radically differently, not just by the government, but by the by the population, by people here in Bloomington. I today put out a call for help for Ukrainians because I'm going and got $3,000 in donations in 65 minutes. I work with Rohingya people in Colorado and I talk, and they're in the meat packing industry, which is horrific. And I talk to people in the town where they live and I say, what do you think about all these Rohingya people here? And they say, what Rohingya people? We have Rohingya people here? I mean, they're not just being discriminated against, they're being invisibilized. So, so I think that this is an inevitable consequence and seeing how this plays out will be really important. Thank you for asking that question. And then, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and another thing, I guess, to bring up is a lot, in regards to refugee crisis, there's already premeditated stereotypes and tropes um, before entrance. Um, and I think, like, do you see that as like also having a difference in impact, or I guess the prolonging of this narrative that will be created inevitably of Ukrainian refugees? The thing about, the thing about Ukrainians, and I um, uh, say this gently, is that Ukrainians have been, in, in the history of Europe, sometimes seen as white Europeans and sometimes seen as racial others. Certainly, um, under the Third Reich, Slavs were not seen as the equivalent of Aryans. So, so I think that category of whiteness is super unstable, and it's easy for undesirables to get kicked out of it. So, um, but that doesn't mean that there won't continue to be gradations of acceptability of different kinds of populations. And, and I think we will open up a large discussion about that coming up, and I think that's a discussion we need to have in public. So it is seven o'clock, past seven o'clock. I think um, it's past, past, past time for our, our um, colleagues from Ukraine to, <laughs> to go to sleep. Um, and, and thank you again so much for being here. Um, w would you like to, um, Timothy or Natalia or both, would you like to close the 
proceedings for, to, for tonight with a last comment, or do you just want to turn off your laptop and go to bed? Thanks. I'll, uh, I'll say one uh, final sentence. Uh, thank you very much again. I have to explain the elephant in the room. Yeah, why have you seen my shower uh, for two hours? <laughs> um, the thing is that uh, right now there is, well, we heard some explosions, uh, two explosions that we heard, and many other airstrikes happened in other cities of Ukraine simultaneously. And this little shower is a, our urgent shelter. So if it's too, uh, complicated or too scary to run to the real shelter, uh, citizens are advised to pick up a spot in their apartment. It can be a corridor or it can be a shower. So whatever with uh, safe walls, it will work. And I'm here with my girlfriend and with my cat. And uh, yeah, and that's it. So that, I just wanted to explain the context. And I'm very uh, grateful that you are uh, that you know about what is happening, that you consider it very seriously, uh, that you raise awareness in your community and you discuss it very deeply with a very profound knowledge of Ukraine. So thank you very much for that. It was uh, a relief for me to spend these two scary hours with you. So thank you very much. I'll just say, Timothy and Natalia, I cannot believe that you put yourselves in harm's way for the last two hours to enlighten us. So thank you for doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you all. And I, I will also close by once again um, thanking all of our wonderful speakers tonight and also um, Sarah and her team at REEI for, for just doing such a phenomenal, phenomenal service to our entire university community during this time. Thank you.